and turn it over to our presenters today. Hi, everybody. I'm Michelle West, and I'm with Aquise. Um, and thank you, Melly, for that. Um, like she said, we're going to be talking about creating a strategic plan that doesn't collect dust after it's made. This is going to be a whirlwind of a presentation that's going to go through all the different main steps that most strategic planners will go through. Um, every strategic planner has a different style, but this will help you to see these are the things that you should look at. And the most important thing I like to cover is how can you make sure that this is a living document that gets used? So first to introduce my, myself, um, here there's a slide that has a picture of me, uh, Michelle West, and I have served in leadership roles for strategic planning, marketing, and development and fundraising for nonprofits. Uh, for almost six years of those, it's been almost about two decades, um, I was on the executive leadership team for a SIL, a Center for Independent Living, as their director of marketing. And so I, I will, throughout the presentation, refer to ILCs, um, you know, independent living centers or centers for independent living as SILs. Um, so I started at Rizé, um after I left um, the independent center in Colorado Springs. And I started at Rizé. So basically, I just do strategic planning and marketing for the independent living movement exclusively. And I've served as facilitator for two collaboratives that Nickel and ILRU have run. Um, I've presented at Nickel, April, and state IL conferences. And then um, I, the rest of the time, I lead marketing solutions for SILs and associations across the US. All right, so what are we going to cover today? Three main things. First, we'll have an overview of what is strategic planning. And then we'll talk about the five parts of a strategic planning process. And then the dust prevention plan is going to be how you can make sure that your strategic plan is actually a living document and gets used. Let's start with the overview. Here we have um, an image of a blueprint on the left side. And then there's a zigzag line that goes to a fully finished house, constructed house. And why we do strategic planning is because we want our sills to be this fully finished house, to have the landscaping, the roof, everything inside done. And we want that to be complete and everything we want, but in order to get there, we have to start with a blueprint, much like a house. And if we don't start with that blueprint, then we might just have some haphazard programs starting. And if we haven't thought through what we're doing, why we're doing it, how we're gonna measure the effectiveness of it, then you know, we might have a lot of programs that are actually taking time away from our five core services or taking you know, time, money away from things that we could be doing to help consumers. So, so that's why we have to do strategic planning. It will be the blueprint for your centers to achieve your center's goals. All right, another principle with strategic planning that I like to talk about, and here there's an image of, there's a light bulb that says idea at the bottom left-hand corner, and it has the blueprint by it. That's where we're gonna start. And that's where all nonprofits or centers start. Then there's an arrow, a, a, a line that goes up to an arc and then back down. And it has arrows along the way. And at each arrow, I'm going to explain um, what that stage is. The first stage is startup. So you start up your center. Your center may be you know, decades old, or, or it may just be a few years. But we're going to have that startup time. And that's when you do your core program development. Then you're growing, you have the infrastructure development, you have finance, HR, marketing, fundraising, you have all these things, program development and management. You have all these things that you're growing towards a sustainable, that's the third stage, sustainable um, center. And that's where there's an image of the house again. That is where you have had, um, your center has reached all the goals that you want to meet, to meet, like your five core services, you have all of the things that you need to sustain your center. And that's when you can start thinking about impact and expansion. You're starting to make some impact and you're thinking about, can we expand upon this? 
Now, where some nonprofits start to, ha this happens to all nonprofits, um, most people say, is that there is a decline at some point. And this is when this line becomes an arc and starts to go down. There's a decline and then the last stage could be dissolve. Now, if you have a dissolution of an organization, sometimes you might have two centers you know, come together or a center might decide, okay, we're gonna have a branch out here. But either way, those would be a type of, um, you know, something has dissolved in the organization. We don't wanna ever get there because the final, the final point and at the end of this line is a little um, circle with a line through it saying closure that, you know, the organization has dissolved, now it's closing. We don't ever want to get there for our center. So what, after this arc of a line at the top has, there's a little dotted blue line underneath it at the decline stage. After you've gotten to the sustain, you have your house built, it, the center is how you want it, you have your five core services running, and you're thinking about the impact you're making, but you're also thinking about expanding. If you start to have some programs decline, that's when the cue is to renew. That's when you have to renew those programs or you can cut out those programs, but you're renewing something, you're renewing a process, a goal, so that you can go back and the dotted line goes to growth. You start back at that second stage of growth, so you can bring that to impact and expansion. Um, this model is, is from Susan K. Stevens' Nonprofit Life Cycles book. Um, it's Staged Wisdom for Nonprofit Capacity. And I'm going to read over here for um, the description. Stage-wise um, stage enterprises 2008 and TCC Group's organizational life cycle model navigating the organization life cycle. It's a capacity building guide for nonprofit leaders. And it was published Washington DC by Board Source in 2005. This model has been used since 2005 as this is what happens with nonprofits. And eventually every nonprofit will go through this cycle. Why this applies to strategic planning and why you need to keep your strategic plan as a living document is so that you have continual goals. You're, say you're in this third stage of sustaining. You're at the top, you have your house built, you're watching for that decline in a program, in number of consumers met, whatever it might be, um, funding that you have, something like that. You're looking for the decline. If you have a strategic planning process in place, then you're gonna be able to note when things are declining because you'll see in the strategic planning process, there are always measures. You're always meeting regularly and you're always measuring regularly to make sure that, you're, that when things start to decline, you can pivot and you can change what your goals are, change programs, stop pro programs, grow them in a different way so that this does, the, the decline and the dissolving and the closure part doesn't apply to your center. All right, having said that, let's get into what is the strategic planning process. There are five, is an image of five columns and they're color coded. The yellow one has a directional sign. The purple one is next. It has two people icons. The third is blue and it has a map. Um, the fourth is green and it has um, a magnifying glass. And then you have the red one is the last one and it has a computer screen with a gear and dollar signs. This is just more decorative, but you're gonna, this is going to be repeated on each slide when I'm talking about the strategic planning process. So I wanted to explain it um, to start. And what each column represents is um, noted on the next slide. So the first one is messaging. The, the strategic planning process starts with messaging and we'll go into what each one of these entails. The second one is stakeholders. Those are basically people like your donors, they're your consumers. There are any kind of volunteers, board members, anyone who has an interest in your center's growth. And then um, you have planning. That's gonna be basically be coming up with your goals for what you want your center to achieve. Analysis is the fourth one. And that's gonna be like market research and going into more data-driven information. And then the fifth one is resources. 
So on all these stages, the next slide has under each column arrows and all those arrows, those five arrows for each part of the process lead to your strategic plan. So in order to get to the strategic plan, you have to go through the thought process of all these five areas. And there is overlap. These are not necessarily sequential where they're isolated. You know, you just deal with messaging and then you just deal with stakeholders. You'll see some overlap in these areas, but mostly um, they, you can dedicate your time to just one area at a time and then move on to the next. All right, so let's start with messaging. The first, process, the first step in the strategic planning process is messaging. And there are six main things I like to include in strategic planning. The first is you go over what your mission statement is, then your vision statement, your core values, your brand pillars, your BHAG, and we'll go over what these are, and your value proposition. Those are all what your messaging will entail. You have to start with that because you need to know where is it, who are we as an organization? And what do we embody? So the next slide, now we have the same image that we had the blueprint with the, zag, the zigzag line and the finished house at the end. Now we've filled in that line. The zigzag line where it, where it you know, points down and points up, there are actually parts of the house building process. So we're gonna use this analogy of building a house to come into why we do messaging and what messaging is. All right, we start on the left, the mission statement. Mission statement is just gonna be one succinct statement that's gonna say, this is what we're about. This is why we exist. And that is the blueprint. It's gonna, it's gonna tell people how we as a center reach our goals. We may say that you know, we exist to help families and individuals with disabilities to achieve the greatest degree of independence they seek in their lives. That might be the mission. Then we're gonna go up that zigzag line and there are core values. Those core values are going to lay the foundation for all the efforts that you make with your, with your staff and your board, volunteers, everything. They're basically gonna be like, what do we embody? We want equality, we want independence. Those might be core, um, core values. And when people embody those things, that lays the foundation for all the future efforts you're gonna make. And then brand pillars is the next um, part of the building process. Now we see, before there was just for core values, a foundation laid. Now we see there's actually some framing to the house. Brand pillars are going to be, this is what our brand, our center stands for. Um, we want these different things to, to, um, to come to be in our community because we exist. And that is where you're framing, you know, the framing and finishing part of the house. It's what makes you different in what you offer your community. So you're gonna have a lot of impact statements with these and they might be things, you know, like dependence for people with disabilities in our community. We're gonna help them achieve their goals, things like that. Now we're gonna go up the line and now there's vision statement. The house has a roof on it now. It's got, you know, maybe it has siding on it, things like that. It, we're working, the vision is gonna be the final product that we're working towards. You can almost see it. It's not totally done like in this house, but this is where we wanna go. And so like the center I worked for, our visions, you know, our vision statement, um, it was different than our BHAG and I'll share that one later, but our, the vision statement is more like where we see ourselves in a macro way, in, a, in the big bird's eye view way. All right, then value proposition. Now we are at the lab, we're at the final product. The house is done, it's gorgeous. The value proposition is the open house. When you have your house done and you have an open house, you're telling others why you should buy this house. Well, the value proposition is why you should join us and why, you should, why people should come and be a part of your center is not because we help create independence. It's the impact to the consumer that should emb be embodied in that value proposition. So all of these statements, messaging statements that are to be developed, they take a while for people to work through. 
And like when I do it, I have a process in, you know, people brainstorm and then we compile those brainstormed ideas and we start to whittle down the ones that people like. And it can, you know, there's a lot of editing that done, that's done and people combine their thoughts. So each one of these has that process. And then the last one is the BHAG. It's big, hairy, audacious goal. And that is how you know you've met your target. You wanna have all these things to help you know where you're going, to help people get on board and have the same philosophy as they're moving forward in their work. But the BHAG is the measure. It is going to, when you have a BHAG statement, like at the Independence Center, we had a BHAG statement that we would be a leader nationwide in, in helping healthcare and independent living basically live together and work well. And so our BHAG was about that. And then we would have, every time we would get something that would say, hey, we've met this BHAG, we've met this goal, we'd have it up on a slide at the board of directors meeting and say, this is how we know we've hit our target because look, we got called to represent at this and we've been part of that. And th those measures are what you need to make sure that all of these messaging statements are living. They are actually happening in reality. All right, so that's why you do messaging and that's what messaging is. It's a process to get there, but it, it actually, as you're guided through this process, a lot of these will feed into each other. And so, you'll find it's not as cumbersome as it might look on here or as building a house is, but they are very valuable and people can rally behind them. This actually will drive to your elevator speech where you will tell people, this is what we're about. And everybody in your staff can know this is when somebody comes and asks me, you know, what is that center you work for? They'll have that, you know, one to two minute speech and it will come from these pieces. So these pieces feed in a lot to your elevator speech, to your goals. Um, so they're very valuable to start with. All right, stakeholders is the next step in the strategic planning process. And stakeholders, it, there are different um, stakeholders that you have. And I wanna use the analogy of building a house again. And now we have a new diagram. Um, it says why stakeholders at the top. And it's a circle. There's a big circle on the outside. And all of the different segments of stakeholders, think of those as the buckets of stakeholders. Um, those are represented by icons that are on this outer circle. Those are, and we're going to use the building analogy again, um, like a builder who's going to build houses and then wants to sell them to the community. They're going to need realtors. So there's an icon of a person. They're going to need buyers, icon of a family. They're going to need subcontractors, icon of a hammer. And then they're going to need vendors to provide them all these materials. And there's an um, icon of a brick wall being built. And in the center is a circle that has in there the word builder with the icon of a person and then a house being built um, or being drawn on a piece of paper with a pencil. So with this diagram, basically what it's saying is the builders in the center of the circle, just like our centers, our sills are in the center. But who do we need to make our center? Instead of realtors, we might need consumers. Buyers, we might need donors. Instead of subcontractors, you might need influencers. Those might be people in the community like partner organizations who help get the word out about your center, but also who you might partner with for, let's say, COVID relief. Um, you know, it, it might be for emergency preparedness. It's people you partner with. So all of those are going to be your stakeholders. Now, just to give you an example of what I what I use when I do strategic planning is um, we go through, and here sh is shown a spreadsheet, and there are five columns. And so I'll read um, this off. The first column is segment. You're gonna think about the large groupings of stakeholders. And so for centers, it could be, again, donors, consumers, influencers, partner organizations. You're gonna do those big buckets. Then we go next to sub-segments. You're gonna break down those larger segments. 
for donors, let's just say we can break those down to volunteers because they're donating their time. You might have monetary donors and those could even be broken down to major donors, you know, over a certain dollar amount. Um, and it could be, you know, just new donors, things like that. So you'd break that down. Consumers, you might want to break it down by disability type. You could break it down by age, by gender, or by interest, like youth transitions. You might just have youth. Um, then we get to stakeholder need. This is um, basically, it's a gap. It's a lack of something that that stakeholder has, and that's why they're coming to your center. So let's say we had consumers was our segment. We broke it down to youth. And what is the gap? What's the lack they have? Well, in our community, let's say it's youth are staying at home and they're not sure, they and their parents are not sure how to get them to launch into the community with the greatest degree of independence they want. That may be what the gap is. And that's what we would put there. The fourth column is the benefit to the stakeholder. What is it that they want from us? Sure, the, the parents may want their child to be safe. The youth may want freedom. So that's a little different than their need. It's the benefit. It's what the, the family is going to get. The parents are going to feel like their kids are safe. And then the kids, the youth, are going to feel that freedom in reaching their goals. Then the relationship type. Um, on these you probably already have some of these going. Like if you have a youth transitions program, then what this helps to think through is what, what are we doing for them right now? And do we want to, do we need to keep them, to keep the, the number we have because we can't do anymore? Um, we can't service any more consumers. Do we want to grow that because we just got a grant? Do we want to stop, which youth transitions, we wouldn't, but in some of these instances, you might, you might find that there's a program that just isn't thriving and, or there's some partner organization that does it better. And so you're going to funnel people there, you know, in, uh, through INR. So you might have stop on that. Or do you want to get them? Let's say, you know, you don't have a youth transitions program, then you would put get. And that helps you see, now you have a dashboard when you're done with this and you, you can say, okay, this is who I want to reach. Messaging told us where we want to go, what we're doing, what we're about. And stakeholders are going to be like, now this is who we want to reach. And this, you know, for SILs can be fairly easy just because we have a lot of directives already that, that detail who our consumers are. But you'll find, you know, each SIL, of course, is so different um, versus rule versus, you know, you might have a different stakeholder analysis for your rural communities than you do for your metropolitan areas. All right, now into planning. The planning process is actually my favorite process. And I think personally, it is where the rubber meets the road. This is where, this is the most important one to me personally. It's your goals. These are the things that a strategic plan really rallies behind and executes. So in the planning stage, we're going to talk about goals, strategies, timeline, and measures. So let's break those down. Here there's an image, a dartboard with three arrows, and they're all hitting the target. So on here, when you're doing planning, the goal is the center of the target. That's what you want to hit. The strategy. So let's say, let's use an analogy of you're, you're um, competing in archery, okay? You're in the Olympic archery competition. Your goal is to hit that center of the target. The strategies for doing that, you might control your breathing. They also have to determine the draw of the string. They assess when, they gonna, when they're going to release that string. Those are all strategies. And then they have timelines. So our timeline might be different. Their timeline is, you know, they have two minutes to shoot three arrows for indoor and four minutes to shoot six arrows outdoor. They have a timeline. For us, our goal might be, let's go to um, a peer support group. Our goal is, let's say, to start a cross-disability um, peer support group online. Now, that is what you're going to do, but the, the goal really needs to hit what do you want people to do? 
with your center. We want people to attend a cross disability support group online because, and that's gonna be the impact you want them to have. It might be because people are, you know, it might be COVID related. People are feeling lost in, in the community now because they can't be in person. Um, you might have something related to that. That might be the end of your goal, but because we want people to feel connected during COVID. Um, and the strategies are gonna be, okay, we're gonna have something online. We're going to um, market this in through partner organizations. And you're gonna have different strategies of how you're going to launch this, but also how you're going to maintain it. Then your timeline, just like you know, in an archery competition, they're very specific. Your timeline's gonna say, okay, we're gonna measure, we're going to say, we can come up, we, we need to like beta test this group. We need to ask consumers, what is it that they want? Then we need to market it. And then we need to set up the virtual platform. You know, you're gonna have all these timelines that are going to break out how you're going to, to reach your goal. The measures, just like in an archery competition, they know they have to shoot 72 arrow, arrows at the target that's set 70 meters away and they have 12 series of six arrows. So they have real specifics. I think for a center, you have to be just as specific if you're wanting to hit that target in the center. Because if you have specific measures, then you can tell, is this really worth our time? Let's say part of the strategy to launch this um, cross disability group was to start a social media campaign and buy Facebook ads for it. You would need real specific measures to say, okay, I'm going to go to Facebook analytics and we want to hit, we want to have, you know, X amount of people who are interacting with our, you know, with our Facebook ad who have clicked it or something like that. Um, and then you might have measures of we want this many people to stay in the group and, and be sustaining, but we also want X amount of new people coming in. These measures are not to say that you don't change them as time evolves because as time evolves, you will need to pivot and change. You might even change your goal a little bit. Definitely change strategies and measures. But you wanna start with really specific measures so that you can know is what I'm doing even producing any efforts. Like social media can be a big pit, endless pit of time that you spend without much return. And so things like that, you really wanna make sure that your measures are, are showing you what is worth your time and making the impact with consumers. All right, so that is basically how you, you come up with goals. I have three goals here. And so the first one is, um, let's say we're gonna, we're, we're gonna come up with a goal about starting a peer support group, right? And here are three different ways that we could phrase that goal. One is start a peer support group by December 2021 that has 12 regular attendees. That's number one. Number two is we're going to establish a cross disability peer support group where consumers develop a support network to reach their goals for greater independence. Or three, we're going to canvas the community and partner organizations to assess needs and gaps for a peer support group. So, I want you to think about which one you think is a good goal. Um, I would love in the chat if you could say if you get it right or not, because um, <laughs> I think most people probably get it right. And the best written goal of these three, the one that was really a well-written goal, the others are not, is number two. What you're doing is you're saying, I'm gonna, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna establish this. And this is what consumers are going to do as a result. And this is why they're going to reach their goals for greater independence. The first one is, those are more, that's like a timeline, right? The first one is December 2021. That's your timeline. The 12 regular attendees is the measure. This isn't, this is useful information, but it's not the goal. It's not how the goal should be stated. And then the third one, canvassing the community to assess needs, that's actually very, very important. Um, but that's more of a strategy to hit the goal. 
So as you go through, you know, making your goals, you might find, especially I would encourage you to do this as a group. You, you might find people come out with stuff like this. That's not a goal, but it's really good stuff that you can feed into your other buckets. So if you have goal strategies, timeline and measures as the categories, you can say, okay, now I have the timeline in there. Everybody agrees it should start by December, 2021. Now I have the measure. Everybody wants 12 regular attendees, et cetera. Um, so that's how some of, that's how a good goal should be developed. Now there are ways to set goals and everybody uses a different technique, but I'd say the most popular one, and I have three listed here, I'll go over those, um, is the second one, our SMART goals. Those are specific, measurable, achie achievable, realistic, and timely. That's what SMART goals are. And I would say that's the most popular way to set goals. OKRs are objectives and key results. And that's using um, Dora's goal formula. And it's, it's basically, I will blank as measured by blank. I will, this is the objective as measured by key results. I don't like that one as much because like we saw in the other three examples on the best goals, um, it doesn't talk a lot about, um, it talks about measures like key results, not necessarily impacts the consumer. So SMART really gets a little bit more to the point, I feel. And then ACEs is a third popular goals setting formula, achieve, conserve, eliminate, steer, and clear. Um, so if you ever see any of these, it's just more FYI for your information. If you ever see these, you'll know, okay, yeah, this is a good goal setting, a proven goal setting um, practice. All right, let's go to the fourth stage in st the strategic planning process, and that's analysis. This one, your data-driven people are gonna love it. Your creatives may not like it as much, but it is so essential. And it basically is going over market research and SWOT analysis. Market research is gonna bring you back a little bit to the stakeholder process. That was our second one where we talked about the segments, you know, like we use the example of consumers um, and youth. That's gonna bring you back a little bit to it, but it's more than that. Market research, you're basically gonna define your goal. We just did that in the third stage of planning, but we're gonna assess what the research need is in the first place. What do we need to know about? What kind of qualitative and quantitative data do we need? Then we're gonna determine the research approach. We're gonna collect data under that research approach, then we're gonna analyze the data and then we're gonna communicate the findings. And those findings are gonna be related to our goal. You can see this process of market research, you probably will need someone who is well-versed in this because um, it does take a, a higher level of um, learning than some of these processes do. But, um, but it's very essential because what will come out of this is real data that is going to qualify your goals. Meaning you want all your goals you wanna qualify. You wanna make sure that you have the assets, all of the resources um, that you have the need in your community, that you have the funding. You're gonna, you're gonna wanna make sure you have all these things um, in line for your goal. Someone might have the good idea fairy might come down and drop a lot of great ideas and people, if they just start chasing after them without determining what the need is, without having any data, qualitative and or quantitative, then you could chase after that dream. People could keep it alive and it could not be making the impact to your consumers that your consumers need. Um, so it's really important to do this. SWOT analysis, um, here's a, um, is a picture of it basically has four squares that are put together. And one is S for strengths, W for weaknesses, O for opportunities, and T for threats. A lot of people are familiar with a SWOT analysis, but you would do this, usually when, when I'm doing this with um, an organization, I do this as an organization wide. Sometimes if we have divisions or departments, we will do this another SWOT analysis for their division and department. But I found that when you do it organization wide, it really, it's very telling on where you should be and in qualifying the goals, making sure that these goals are good goals, 
this is very helpful because you're going from, you know, you go from the goals, setting something really specific and everybody's like, woo, in their area, they love it. But then when you get to the SWOT analysis and everybody is thinking at the macro level, it brings people back to, oh, wait, this is what we're about. So through this process, it's actually very beautiful to see. You have messaging, everybody's together. They see the macro. Then they go to stakeholders and they're concerned about their group, you know, that their, their group, their subsegments um, of stakeholders that they want to reach. So they get a little granular. Um, they get a little, you know, uh, myopic in their view. But then you keep going back to the big goals. And then you go back to SWOT analysis in its macro, the organization. And through all these processes of going back and forth from thinking about your area of concern to the organizations, it really helps people stay on target to what the center is all about and, and what things are best. And a lot of times if people are fighting for their goal, then through this process, this, this a lot of times will, they, they will get on board and they'll be like, oh, wow, this doesn't really fit what I really want to happen. Um, so on your strengths, what you think about is what do you do well? Weaknesses, where do you need to improve? And those could be gaps in services. Um, it could also be another partner organization is doing something better than we are. So why are we spending our time doing it? Um, o might be what are your goals, your opportunities, and threats are the obstacles you face. So this has a big process, but usually when you look at this at the macro level of your organization and then you bring it down to your goals and you think about that, then you know, okay, we have a strength in this area. Say, say your goal is to start that peer support group. What are our strengths? Well, we have um, great peer support um, staff members who, who lead our groups. Okay, but where do you need to improve? And that might be um, our community. No one knows that we have these um, peer support groups. And so you think through this and it helps you know, especially like with marketing, where, what do I need to target? We, if, if your strengths are you have a great peer support counselor, then you can put that person up front and center and say, this person has you know, done this, this, and that. But if no one knows about you, then you'll know, okay, that's my trigger of, I need to get some marketing about this peer support group. If it's the inverse, let's say you don't have a peer support counselor, um, that's your weakness, but you're marketing your group, great. And people are coming, but it's sort of mayhem because no one's really leading it well. Okay, that's a different thing. Then you know you don't need to do marketing you need to hire somebody well. So that's what this SWOT analysis will lead you to something very practical. All right, last stage of the strategic planning process is resources. Now that you've gone through this whole process, you know what you're about, you know who you're trying to reach, you know what you want to achieve, and you have thought through, how am I gonna achieve it? Should we even achieve it? Because during that SWOT analysis, a lot of times I'll see goals sort of drop or change. Um, and then sometimes new ones come up that people didn't think about. So now you're at a really good point of, re of talking about resources. What do we need to make these goals happen? And do we even have the resources to do this? All right, under resources, there are four big buckets of resources that you need to think about. Money, people, time, and assets. So let's go through those. I'm gonna give some sample questions of what each area has. And right now there's um, an Im there's a decorative type of image that has money with an icon um, that's green and has an icon of dollar bills, people that's purple and it has an icon of a person's head with gears in it. Time, it's an hourglass with sand going down. And assets, um, there's a wrench and a screwdriver crossed. And so those are just icons to represent each area that we'll be talking about. With money, you're going to be thinking, so this is where a lot of times I'll have divisions or departments get, you know, separate, and they'll go to just their division and department, and they'll talk about their specific goals. And these are the kinds of questions that they'll go through. What budget do I need to complete this goal with the peer support group? Say we need Facebook ads, money for flyers. Um, let's say that's it. You would just say, okay, we need this. 
does your current budget contain any of the projected costs? That way you'll know if you need to add another line item or if you have to try to get money somewhere else. And then if the goal isn't revenue producing, say it's not a fee for service program or something, um, then where will the money come from? So you're, you know, those are the kinds of questions that, that we go through with money. There is, this is where it would be very important to bring in one of your financial folks, your controller, um, an accountant, something like that. This is a spreadsheet that I've used in the past. Um, and it basically, I won't go through all the detail on this uh, because you, no one can really read it, but um, it's so fine print. But basically the title is project funding request slash budget. You put your goal underneath that. And then there's, um, there's the first column and it has different sections. So you're gonna think about personnel costs, benefits for those people those costs, travel expenses, and then miscellaneous other project costs. Um, some are subject to FNA, et cetera. Some are not, um, if that applies. And then you have modified total direct cross project costs. Some people are sleeping by now because it's financial. And so, <laughs> and some people are loving this, but those are the kinds of categories that we're seeing on the spreadsheet. The columns to the right are basically the yearly project costs. So you're gonna go and line item all the project costs you have but then you're gonna break it down by year. And so your goal is gonna be, okay, we're gonna start this, um, this peer support group. We're actually just gonna try for it for a year. Let's just say, you may not have year one, year two, year three, you might have quarterly project costs and just say Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4 total. And that's, this is what the budget is. This is really important because sometimes you may start running down the road towards a goal and you don't have the money for it and it just stops or you have to rob Peter pay Paul and it causes problems. So this is just good, good planning. All right, next thing is people. Do we have the people to do this? This is a lot of the times the money is really clear on if people have the money for it not or not. People usually know that, but people is sometimes what gets overlooked. People, sometimes I think it's just human nature. We just think, we, we, we can do this, we're excited. But the, the support staff who we're gonna rely on to do this have their own goals and responsibilities. Have we co coordinated what they're gonna be doing with them? Have we asked them if they're a one FTE and they're working 40 hours and they have a full slate of work and they're, they're overworked maybe a little bit and we're thinking we're gonna add this on? No, that doesn't work. Um, they're gonna get burnout and it, you know, it's something that really has to be, that's a top thing problem I see that has to be thought about. Do you need to outsource something? If so, what is that? And then does your team even have the talent, the knowledge, skills, and abilities to complete this goal successfully? So if you're saying we're going to do this social media campaign and do Facebook ads, do they even know how to do that? Um, that's an example. So those are the question, types of questions we go through. All right, with time, what percentage of time will it take for you and the other stakeholders to get the goal started? Um, because that can, it could take a whole long time to do something. And if you haven't thought through what it's going to take, you know, like all those steps we went through on the peer support group, just that you're going to have to have all those steps. Does anyone have the time to do that? What percentage of ongoing responsibilities does it take? Startup is usually more time than sustaining or maintaining something, usually, depending on what the goal is. So I would think of it's gonna take and then for maintaining, how much time will that take from people? And then do you need to move some of your goals to other years? Let's say you've gone through this process and everybody's like, oh my gosh, no, we don't have the time to do this. Well, it doesn't mean you have to ditch, ditch it. It means that you could bring it to the next fiscal year. And so that's why I like at the end, you'll see there's a chart where we put all of the different goals push it to another year, don't lose that good goal because it just may not be the time. Then for assets is the fourth um, type of resource to think about. Some examples on this is the questions you might think about. Are there any software or hardware necessities that we need to meet our goals? Um, do, we have, do we need any other assets? And then do we have the budget for them? All right, so those are the types of resource questions that you'll ask. And you look at resources one, to make sure that your goals are smart and that's specific, measurable, achievable. And so we, we want to look at those, right? 
And you want to make sure that your goals are smart. It's qualifying the goals again. It's making sure that our goals are good goals that we can be successful with and that fit with our mission. We want to determine what our strengths are so that we can play to those and lead with those as we start something new or try to build something. And then we want to determine what the potential threats might be so that those don't sabotage our efforts. All right. Now, the last part is the dust prevention plan. How do we make sure that now we've got, we've gone through all the stages of strategic planning. We know what, what our goals are, who we're trying to reach, why we exist, and we're all like excited about this. We know we have the resources for it, and we know where we need to get resources and how we're going to do it, right? So by the time you've gone through all this, people are pumped. They're ready to run with their goals, and they're ready to get out of the planning process, to be honest. <laughs> but how do you make sure that people don't lose momentum and that it's not just something that, yeah, remember we talked about that? Whoops, didn't happen this year because we got so tied up with just maintaining um, you know, our, our functions that, that we're supposed to be doing. All right. What I like to do is, first of all, I like to ask my... Um, the, the people who, the organization I'm working with, to go through and put down, here is a spreadsheet. And it's pretty simple and it's color coded. On the top, um, there, are spy, there are six columns. The first one is fiscal year. And then the, the next four are Q1 to Q4. And then the last one are measures. This is a quick little dashboard to show you what we're gonna do this fiscal year. So you take all these goals, all these ideas, and you've already filled, you know, qualified them through, do we have the resources and the people and all this stuff? And you see, wow, um, my department has five goals. We can only reach three this year. Like no way can we do more than that, let's say. What you do is under this fiscal year, the first column underneath that in red is goal one, goal two and you might have a goal three, right? Those are the goals you're gonna do this fiscal year that you're committing to that you know safely you can do. Then Q1 to Q3 under there, all of those cells in the, in the spreadsheet are yellow. And those are basically strategies. That's how we're gonna reach our goals. And then the last column, all of it is measures. And you're gonna break that up down by quarters. So let's say, I run, I'm an IL program manager under this, you know, um, and I, I cover these three, you know, two core services. I'm gonna have one goal for each core service, let's say, and one's gonna be peer support. And my, that's gonna be starting that cross disability support group by December, 2021. Um, that's gonna be my first goal. And I'm gonna put it how we wrote that goal. Then the strategies are gonna be in Q1, I need to meet with my consumers to see what do they want this, this um, support group to be like. I'm going to have something that INR can hand new consumers to say, you know, to, to try to get interest, um, to see what they want, but also um, to see if they want more information, to be on an email list, stuff like that. You're going to have those strategies Q1. Q2, it might be, okay, I really need to figure out how we're going to host this online. Um, and then Q3, it might be now we're going to market it because we know what, and Q2 would be, you know, we're going to firm up what the goals are based on the Q1 data. And then Q3, okay, we're going to set this up, set up the, the online group, do invitations, et cetera. So you see, and of course, Q4, you'd launch it. Measures, it has broken down by Q1, Q2, 3, 4. You're going to go in and you're going to say, okay, in Q1, I want to get feedback, a good sampling of data from my consumers. So I want X amount of consumers to, you know, fill out this survey. And then, you know, let's just say, for example, Q4, you're going to break it down into, I want, you know, that's when you've launched it. I want X amount of people to, to um, come to our support group and you're going to have other measures. So that's how you would do it. So, you're, so each department, each person leading goals, making sure that those are, the pe those are the people who are responsible to see if this goal actually comes to fruition, they can have this little dashboard. And what I've done, like some people put it on their board and they look at it and they're just like, am I on target? You know, it reminds them, this is my goal. This is how I'm gonna reach it. 
And so it, it also makes it very reasonable um, for them to, you know, it's not overwhelming when they see, okay, it's broken up by quarters and this is what I do. Now, you wanna vet each goal or qualify it, like we've been saying. Um, and this is another layer you can add to it. You don't have to, because really your dashboard is this that we just went over. But what we're seeing here is the same spreadsheet, but it's spread out because there were some hidden columns and that talks about money, people, time, and assets. This might be a process that people do for the goals and just to make sure, okay, do I really have the money, the people, the time, and assets? Or it could be the reminder of, okay, yeah, I need to get money for this part of it. I need to make sure that I bring in these other staff members, things like that. But basically, this is just an example of a dashboard you can use, put it on a bulletin board, hang it on your wall somewhere where people can see it, be reminded, and it keeps that strategic planning process alive. Another way to do this, in addition to the dashboard, because each person has this dashboard, right? These col this color-coded um, spreadsheet. The strategic planning quarterly meetings are essential. This is where you bring back the whole group that came in for strategic planning. All of the people who are leading goals and making sure that those are, those are gonna be done, those, all those people need to be in these meetings. And you would have quarterly meetings. So what you do is everybody knows after you finish your strategic plan, people have this dashboard we just went over. They know what their goals are, when they need to accomplish it. But see how it's broken down Q1 to Q4? Well, during that quarterly meeting, they're going to discuss, wow, I really came, I wasn't able to do any of these because, and that's okay. But I'm going to move those and I'm going to shift the timeline a little bit. And they're going to talk about some of the obstacles they face. They're going to be able to brainstorm and meet as a group to say, okay, this, how, how can I fix this? Um, how can I make this goal happen? Because it isn't going as I planned. Or there's going to be a time for celebration at this quarterly meeting to say, wow, I met it and I'm so excited. So that's why you have quarterly meetings and people know what they're going to have to report on. They know their measures. And so it's real clear. It's real succinct. So what you do, this is an example of just um, one organization's thing that we did. And basically it has um, the, the planning for these quarterly meetings. You have three columns, date, action item, and responsible party. The date is gonna be, okay, by this date, we wanna distribute the, the strategic plan documents. The responsible party to do that is, and you fill it in. The other line items are, um, and this is after you create the strategic plan, you distribute them, and then we're gonna to meet to prioritize our goals and introduce the quarterly goal planning process, which is this. And then we're gonna have quarterly goal coaching sessions, especially the first few. You're gonna have, you know, you're gonna say, you're gonna have someone like the CEO or whoever led the strategic planning, something like that is, someone like that is going to go in there and say, you know, like after the first month of the first quarter, how is it going? And what roadblocks are you facing? Let's talk about how to make this happen. And then you're gonna do that maybe the second month of Q1. Then the third month of Q1 is gonna be the next item. Q1 goals um, are emailed to those leading the strategic planning process. People are gonna say, okay, these are my goals. These are my future goals are gonna come after that. And you're going to go through this process to where basically, all of these line items lead to the same thing. You do your strategic plan, you distribute those documents, you create this dashboard about so people know what their deliverables are. They're working on Q1 strategies, watching for those Q1 measures. You meet after Q1 and you say, how did it go? You help each other. It's a team thing. It's not a punitive thing, right? Where you're graded. You, you, you rally together, you celebrate and you actually brainstorm to help people for Q2, because then you start talking at the Q1 meeting of what you want to do for Q2. And then you just keep repeating that at you know, Q2. You're going through your strategies. You're talking to people. If you start to hit roadblocks, you have a Q2 meeting, you talk about Q3 goals. This is how you prevent your strategic plan from collecting dust because people will be excited. They're celebrating every quarter. They're also getting help every quarter and goals are not dying. And then you have an annual, after Q4, you have another, let's refresh it. 
let's do an annual um, what are we going to do for next fiscal year? You bring back those other goals that may have gotten tabled because remember, like this one department had five, they could only do three. They're going to consider those other two and they're going to think about new ones. And this is how you keep it going and you keep the excitement. And this is how you start building that house. So we have this image again of the blueprint to the house and that zigzag line. And let me tell you, if you do that, whatever blueprint you have, you are going to get to that built house how you want it if you keep this process going. So that is in a very quick nutshell um, how strategic planning can go and what it can do for your center. And if you have any questions, um, please do email me. The next slide just has the Apres logo and um, if you do, I'm offering those who attended this, and even if they, if you look at this as a recording later, if you want a free 30 minute consultation with me and to ask about any of this stuff, um, then please do contact me. The contact information here is Michelle West. Email is hello at apresay.com and um, phone number 719-425-9050, or you can reach me at apresay.com. So um, if you can just email me questions ahead of time, that way we can really maximize um, our 30 minute time frame, And then you can ask whatever questions you want um, about any, if you have um, any questions about marketing, you can do that as well, but um, definitely about the strategic planning. So thank you for attending and my time is done, so. <laughs> Thank you so much, Michelle. And just to remind everyone that um, Mary did put um, Michelle's contact information in the chat and also the link for the evaluation. So please do complete that. And we would like to thank uh, Michelle and our interpreter team and our cart operator and Mary. Thank you all so very much and um, have a wonderful rest of your day and catch you back here for more April conference. Thank you.